Hey, I'm Nathan Tabor with Handling Life. Thank you so much for joining our podcast today. I want to welcome a friend that I've known for a long time, since 1998, David Botkins. I met him uh, in Virginia when I was working for the Attorney General's uh, PAC, who was running for governor, and he was uh, involved in the campaign as well. David, thank you so much for uh, joining me today, and it's good to, to see you, man. Thank you so much, Nathan. I'm really, really happy to be here on the 4th of July. I think it's uh, a most appropriate time for us to have this conversation. Yeah, you know, you know, we have the the blessings and the comfort in in Christ, but to live in a to be born in a country and live in a country where we have the freedom to to gather in churches or gather on podcasts and talk about our faith and our religion, um, you know, there's a lot of people in the world who can't do that these days. Yeah, and that's really unfortunate because people want to be transparent with each other. They want to be authentic. They want to have a heart connection. And in some countries, that is not encouraged. Uh, in this country, it's, it's encouraged. And I just thank you for being someone that's willing to facilitate it. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And, you know, we were talking a little bit before we got, you know, kind of officially started here with this. When we kind of knew each other, there was a, probably a different time in our life. Um, I was younger and um, you were younger in maturity for me. And, but I was saved. And at that point, you had... That's correct. I was not what I would consider uh, a believer at that time, or at least a, a born again believer. Um, I knew of Jesus Christ intellectually, and I, I knew him from textbook sort of experiences, having gone through the catechism process when I was uh, uh, going to a Lutheran church at that time. Um, and in my younger days going through the catechism, but it wasn't until a number of, of challenges and life experiences that really brought me to the end of myself uh, that God revealed himself in a pretty dramatic way, and I made a public profession of faith in late January of 2002, and it really started me uh, all, all over on my uh, journey of faith and where it became deeply personal and, and deeply real. And I mean, so I mean, by that time, you, how old were you, January 20, 2002? Yeah, there? let's see. I'm 54 now. I was born in 65. So I would have probably been about 34 years old, I think. Yeah, I mean, and, and at that age for someone to, you know, you got to deal with a lot of pride, right? A lot of self-centeredness, a lot of what are other people going to think? Absolutely. That was that was one of the things that did uh, uh, sort of sort of weigh on me because, you know, what I did for a living, uh, Nathan, being the spokesperson and press secretary for a candidate for governor at that time, had been attorney general for four years. And interestingly, he was a man of faith. He was a born again evangelical Christian. And, you know, he had me on his staff as his chief, chief spokesperson. So, Clearly, he saw something in me that I maybe didn't even see in myself. And um, when he lost that race for governor, my identity was completely shattered because I, I didn't know what I was going to do for a living. I think I wanted it more than he did, and he was the candidate. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, he, he was very gracious to me after that election and when we lost, and I was unemployed for the first time in my life. And he took me out for coffee and he bought me a book, which I have to this day. And he said to me, he said, David, you know, if my losing the race for governor is what ultimately helped you come to faith, then it was worth it for me to lose. And that's always stuck with me that hmm. he felt like one more believer in the kingdom is more important than him being the governor of Virginia. That's pretty profound. Yeah. And, uh, you know, those listening, his name's Mark Early, and and I've stayed in touch with Mark over the years. Not, you know, a lot. Once, you know, here or there we'll bump into each other on Facebook or LinkedIn. But um, he's one of those guys that's always been. He kind of he walked the walk and talked the talk. But he was, I mean, he's a sinner saved by the grace of God. But he was pretty on point. And I remember one time he pulled me to the side and you know kind of had that conversation of, hey, you know. Just remember, you're, you'll be known by your actions. 
And, you know, as an early, I was in my mid twenties, so I kind of had the world by the tail and, you know, at the time it didn't really sink in, but that's, that's one of those seeds that are planted that is a goal of, of this type of show. You know, we're probably not going to catch somebody and turn them immediately around, but those little things that can be said to people, if Mark had set you down and said, David, you're a horrible individual, you do this, 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 and this, and you need to get your heart right and, and get saved, probably wouldn't have had the impact on it that just that simple little thing he said to you. Yeah, I think you're right, Nathan, and I have come to learn that true faith and coming alongside someone with a heart connection rather than a head connection is really, really important because, and, and I've had to learn this the hard way with, with people in my life that I cared about, lecturing them and holding them to a standard that you're not even meeting yourself uh, is not nearly as effective as having a true heart connection and then letting God lead not only you and what you say uh, to help them, but also letting God lead and how they process what you shared with them. It's not up to us to uh, browbeat people into uh, a biblical faith-led lifestyle. It's up to the Lord to lead. And when you're connecting by your heart rather than your head, I think that makes things a lot more real and a lot more possible. Yeah, because when I, you know, I grew up in the independent Baptist, Southern Baptist, you know, you do this because if you don't, God's going to, you know, judge you. You know, God's going to punish you. So that really that key phrase there of the heart connection, if you're right with God, your actions will follow towards God. If you're only doing it because you think or someone's telling you you need to, so you're doing it out of your mind, as soon as they're not telling you you need to do it, you're back to doing the old stuff. Yeah, I think that's definitely right. And I think, you know, experience is a wonderful thing. Um, life and the bumps and bruises that we take along the way, uh, I think, are God's way of preparation uh, so that when we get to heaven, uh, you know, we'll finally get to rest uh, with him in a sinless, in, in a sinless world, in a sinless environment. But uh, between now and that time, we're going to continue to have opportunities to stretch ourselves, uh, to learn to lead with the heart uh, more than the head. And it, it is a journey. Uh, I wish I had sort of learned some of these lessons much earlier in life, but uh, things happen for a reason. It's important to hold these things with an open hand and not a closed fist, because at the end of the day, even though we think we might control an outcome, the reality is we're not. Yeah, that's very true. And in, in that comment you made there holding people to a standard do you find that to be really hard i mean you're in you know past political you're still in pr you're around a you know fair amount of people on a regular basis and then just our regular lives facebook and in family and friends do you find that hard when you you know, start looking at someone's life and saying well the reasons you have those problems is and then fill in the blank yeah, I think it was harder in, in, in the past and even in the recent past. It's not as hard now, I think, because of the life experiences that I've had, some, some very uh, unhappy, unfortunate circumstances that tends to humble you. Um, and I think I'm now finally at a, at a place in life where I'm more forgiving. Uh, I'm more honest with myself. I'm more... Uh, patient and um, willing to listen to others, uh, whether I agree with them or not. I think listening is a skill that believers need to uh, take more um, opportunity to do rather than talking. I think listening is important. So it has been hard in my in my life for sure, particularly when you're a leader of a large team, which I am not anymore. But when you when, when you're a leader of a large team of people in a large corporate organization, I think you're expected to uh, hold the team accountable, to drive for results, to perform, to meet expectations. And the way the American culture is wired and the way corporate America is wired, where you're meeting uh, quarterly dividend expe expectations, you know, we live in a hard charging, a hard charging country. And that's why we're a superpower and so successful. 
But the reality is individually, we need to think about at the right time, slowing down, smelling the roses, holding life with an open hand, listening, being forgiving, being transparent, and really trying to model the way Christ lived his life. Uh, and the only way to do that is to sort of dive into his word in the Bible and let that be your roadmap for your relationships, and for how you live your life. So in that vein there of, you know, maintaining, you said about the humility, being humble, leading to forgiveness. What's the thing, thing or things you find in your life that help you stay there? Because as you know, it's really easy when somebody burns you or hurts you at home or at work. The natural reaction is to get bitter or to get even or seek vengeance, not to forgive. So yeah. how, do you, how do you in your life stay in that, you know, humble, forgiving spirit? Yeah, that's a boy. That's a great question. And that's there's a lot to unpack you know, with that question. I, I think because I have I've been burned, I've been hurt uh, and it's happened more than once. The Lord has given me the opportunity to learn that lesson because I have mishandled it on uh, more than one occasion. But I had uh, <clears throat> I had a mentor, and I've been very fortunate to have several uh, mentors come alongside me, older men, believers, uh, who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, that took an opportunity to share with me their thoughts, their experience, their wisdom. And you know, when those opportunities come along for people like you and me, we either have the chance to inculcate that and process it and make something of it, or we can ignore it and dismiss it and forge ahead under our own strength doing the things that we want to do our own way. I've done it both ways. When I have sort of subordinated my own ego and listened to an older person who has said to me, David, you know, this might be a moment for self-reflection and humility and an opportunity for you to see what maybe you contributed to the problem. What was it that you might have said or done that was misunderstood that actually exacerbated the, the problem or the challenge that you're experiencing? So those opportunities and me availing myself of them has been what has been helpful. Um, I do think entering into a situation where you feel like you've been wronged and someone has uh, maybe got the upper hand on you, entering into that um, disagreement with a spirit of humility and a spirit of seeking to understand their point of view and basically having a curious heart about what it was that got you crossways. Because if you're dogmatic about it and you want revenge and you've got your, your back up, exactly the things that you outlined when you asked this question, all that does is make things worse. Um, I, I, you know, the Bible and, and, the, and the Lord talks about humility a lot. There's a reason for that. And it's because ultimately it w will lead to a, a better outcome. Yeah. And, you know, in that you know, James 3 talks about applying our own wisdom versus God's wisdom, earthly wisdom versus biblical wisdom. And in my life, and I'm sure in yours, when I've done things my way, it felt good for a time period, maybe a few minutes, maybe a few days, few weeks. But eventually the misery, the bitterness, the conflict came roaring back in because it wasn't handled the right way. Yeah. They call that operating in the flesh. Yes. And, and uh, um, you know, letting your own uh, flesh and, and ego drive the way you interact and, and control things. And that, that just typically doesn't work. Uh, you know, in a perfect world, and I think when we come to the end of our life, if we stay, you know, true to seeking God, um, eventually the way we operate naturally will become more Christ-like so that when we are responding, we're actually responding naturally in a biblical, loving, godly, Christ-like way. That's the desire. It shouldn't be either or. It should be an integrated life that allows you to respond with your own unique gifting and with your own unique personality 
God gave us a personality for a reason. He expects us to be who we are. But I think he also expects the risen Christ to inform who we are. And that only comes with some effort. You know, and in the, the Bible and that and the personality and what God has asked of us, you know, I, I for a long time in my own mind, I complicated my relationship with God. I was like, oh, there's all these things I have to do. I was putting the mind part first. But really, I mean, there's only a few things God asks of us. He, he asks us to obey. He asks us to show the love of Christ to others. And he asks us to share the gospel with others. He doesn't tell us to go out and soul win. He tells us to go out and plant seeds. The Holy Spirit will do the soul winning. So it's really when we start into, you know, what does God expect of us? The list is very, you know, small numbered, low. But when that heart changes, then all the things that God wants us to do start becoming, I don't know if it's easier or at least, you know, easier might be the best word, easier to do. Because if you're in conflict or you're miserable or you're stressed out, you can't show the love of Christ to someone. And even if you do, it comes off as fake. You're so right about that, Nathan. Absolutely. And I, I think um, the simplicity of what God expects of us um, is really freeing. It's, it's liberating. The yoke is gentle. The yoke is light. and we do complicate it as you were describing about how you've complicated it in, in your life. We, we try to over engineer things and we have a way of messing it up. But if we embrace the simplicity of what the, what the gospel is and what the gospel offers, it allows us to be better examples to others and certainly uh, better mentors. You know, you've heard the expression, pay it forward. I think about those people that have come alongside me and encouraged me with godly wisdom. And I think what I aspire for the rest of my life as I look at the second half is how to do that for other people, how to pay it forward. And that's why I think what you're doing with your podcast and your other work is so vitally important because you're paying it forward now. Thanks, man. I, you know, I appreciate that. And I, I, much like you, I mean, we, we have similar stories, you know, but I was saved at an earlier age, you saved it later, but I mean, kind of a similar you know life stories in the sense of you know having our fun and then you know getting back to where god wanted us to be but you know i think back over my life when younger when people would come and want to talk or they had a problem and yeah i kind of listened but more like gosh could you hurry up and like get through this you know or stop whining or you know something and and there's more of a compassion now in my life more of a desire to, you know, some people you can't help, but they got to be at a point where they, you know, they really want to make a change, but it is really unique and, and, and a feeling that I can't even describe to be able to sit down and, and call it mentoring, but I, I mean, I'm 45, so I don't know if I'm a mentor yet, right? But to sit down and, and talk with someone or more listen and then give them some advice. Uh, so it's cool to hear that that's something you're you know, God's been laying on your heart because isn't that something, I mean, it's biblical. Seek wisdom and counsel of others. Ecclesiastes, three chords. Can you imagine what would happen in our society today if men and women who were serving the Lord and striving to better the kingdom would take the time to be that mentoring, you know, three chords type to others in their lives? What would happen in America? It could be transformational. It could be absolutely transformational. I knew I know that there are examples of that that are indeed going on, but I don't think everybody that's uniquely gifted, uh, and some people don't even realize or think that they're gifted, but they really are because of their unique life experience. And and uh, at, at the church I attend, it's Hope Presbyterian in Goochland, uh, just across the Henrico County line. Uh, Hope has got a, a mentoring program uh, that's led by a men that's been a mentor to me, a guy named Tommy Thompson. And Tommy has taken this on as a commitment of himself uh, as he looks at the second half of his life, and he's actually teaching it to others. So not only is he doing it um, uh, personally with people that come into his life like me, but he's 
he's taking it seriously and he's he's organizing an effort around it and and putting some structure around it almost like a curriculum and sending others from the church out to do exactly what you and I are talking about now so i think you know what you're saying about it could be transformational and how great it could be i agree and i think there's some people that recognize that as well and really want to help ignite that across the country or at least certainly where they happen to be at the time. Yep. So, you know, this, this is my premise in that, that if someone's truly saved, so this is, you know, reaching the people who have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, they already know. I, when I was at the point in my life, I knew what I needed to do. I needed to get right with God. But instead of doing that, I was dealing with all the other problems, the symptoms in my life. I mean, when I finally got with a guy, a gentleman, Howard Wilburn, he's a retired pastor now, who would just listen to me. And, you know, two years later, he came, you know, he laughs and chuckles and says, you know, the point of sitting down with you was to let you talk through so you could realize yourself. You already knew what you needed to be doing. You just needed to get it out. You needed to lay it out on the table, spell it out map it out and then have someone say yes that's what god wants you to do yeah that's a great that's a great thing it's uh it's something how how much we struggle in our our younger selves how we we grapple and we struggle and we 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 grind and claw our way through the fog of war the fog of sin until we see the the clearing ahead and and then suddenly it's so obvious. Uh, what I think is beautiful about that is that God is working and God is with us through all of it. Uh, it's our own it's our own angst that prevents the clarity from being there from the beginning. But God uses those things and he works with us where we are. He doesn't leave us where we are, which is what's so beautiful about it. But the struggle is in a way what makes the end of the journey and coming through it that more beautiful. I look back on some real struggles in my life and have an appreciation for the grappling I was going through at the time. And you certainly don't feel it at the time you're suffering and you're in the crucible of the moment and it's hot in there. You want out, but once you have come through it to the other side and you look back, you can see that these things had a reason and it was God's refining of us. That's the way God works. It's a constant refining process as the impurities literally are burned out of us. Yeah. When you were in that point in your life, did you have those thoughts, you know, where is God or why is God leaving me here? Or no one will understand. I can't talk to anybody about this. Did any thoughts like that run through your mind during those deep, dark moments in your life? I did. I had certainly had those deep, dark moments because I think instinctively, for whatever re reason, humans are wired to kind of go inside. They're, they're wired to withdraw and to look in themselves for the answer. And that's the last thing we ought to be doing. If we're going to go inside, we better be taking God with us to help us decode it and figure it out. If we, if we go inside ourselves, looking within ourselves, within the flesh to come up with the answer, it's going to be the wrong one. Uh, and I have had those moments. But it's when I have gotten outside myself, brought in a third party, knowing that I needed to hear the word of God because I wasn't discerning it on my own but i had enough sense to know that god's got a better answer than i could ever come up with so i have been blessed to have god whispering to me david you're not going to figure this out you need another voice a voice that's going to speak godly wisdom to you so even in my darkest moments i was able to to seek the lifeline of a believer that could help me through it much like the gentleman that you referred to for yourself and so I think that's that's a wonderful thing. God works through us to help other people. So how do you think we get others, you know, those who are listening and, and those who are suffering? How do we encourage people? Hey, you know, you're not alone. Every, if every Christian is honest, 
and, and a lot can't be because they're still going through some processes. Everybody's been at that point in their life. Everybody's had that moment or mo lots of them like, where is God? Why is God? Why is God? This is one of my favorites. It runs through my head. Why is God doing this to me? Mm -hmm. And how do we encourage folks that are in that position to say, hey, find, find that mentor, find that, you know, they don't have to be in mentor can, you know, kind of denotes older, mature age wise, but it could be somebody who's younger or your same age. Find somebody who is spiritually at a good place in their life to talk to you. How do we encourage people to do that? Yeah, I think there is a, uh, a, a suite of options available to people who are struggling. The first thing I would suggest is find a, 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 a Bible-based, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church and go to church for corporate worship where you're with other people. You know, I've always believed, Nathan, that church is basically just a big hospital. Uh, everybody's broken. Everybody's hurting. Everybody's got their struggles. So when I walk in the sanctuary at my church on Sunday morning, I feel like I'm walking in a hospital. There are people that uh, need the kindness and need the encouragement of their fellow, fellow believers. And many of us at Hope are wired and oriented that way. So I would suggest to the, the person watching this podcast who is looking for some answers, start going to a Bible-based church, maybe at the invitation of a friend who's asked you to to go before and maybe you've declined for whatever reason. Secondly, there's a version of the Bible called the message. And the message written by Eugene Peterson is beautifully simple in its narrative. It's a translation of the Bible that's conversational English. And so if you've never picked up a Bible and read it, but you've been thinking about it, I would encourage you to try that version and let God's word speak to you in common English. Some people are intimidated by the Bible because it's big, it's thick. They think about it as a history book or something laborious and hard to get through. I think if you read the gospel, start with John in the message, that can be encouraging to you. And then thirdly, I started something while I was in Israel. I had heard about doing it. Is that not an incredible country, man? Just sorry to interrupt there. Is that just... I went uh, four years ago. Does it not just bring the Bible alive to be, you know, standing on the banks of the Jordan River or on top of uh, Mount Olive and that? I mean, is it just not? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I think it's so wonderful that we're doing this podcast at this time, because I'm just back from Israel. It's July 4th. It's our nation's birthday. You and I have a rich history and our friendship that goes back to political days. Um, and, you know, we're at a point in our faith where we're able to share with others uh, ways to find life in Christ. Um, the third ex example of that I was going to suggest to, to folks is to consider journaling. You know, I was never someone, even though I'm a former newspaper reporter and I wrote stories, two and three stories a day, every day for five years before I left my journalism career, I never was a journaler personally. But since I was in Israel the whole time there, and since I've gotten back, I've started keeping a, a journal. And I record my thoughts, my day, my interactions with other people. And that allows me to take what's spinning around in my head and put some clarity to it, pencil to paper, think later about it and process about, okay, how would, how would God want to enter into this situation? Or what's a What's, what's a biblical overlay or a lens or a filter I could put over that situation that might bring some some sense or clarity to it? So go to a Bible-based church, keep a journal, read the message, and listen to Nathan's podcast. That's the fourth one, right? Uh, listen to the Handling Life podcast. Absolutely. Tell you what, man, that journaling thing, writing things down, um, I've been doing that for seven or eight years now during this mm. entire pro you know pre you know coming back to the lord of just you know the thoughts and to go back and start looking at those things but i don't get the satisfaction out of typing things out and i'm very you know technology and and using notes and all of that but something about getting a pen and a piece of paper and just sitting down for a few minutes and you know here's my prayer request here's 
something I'm really, you know, struggling with. I don't know where God wants me to go, you know, which direction or what. And then to go back two weeks or two months and look at and see like, oh, how did God answer that? Wow. And I, then I feel back in, you know, this was, you know, I shouldn't have been worrying about this because it was resolved this way in a way that I didn't even think that it would be resolved. God resolved it in his way and in his timing. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's a, that's a gift that we as humans have the ability to mentally process and, and write and codify our thoughts on paper. You know, back when the, uh, the founders were contemplating this great country, uh, on this day, it was celebrated when we, we were formed as a nation. The founding fathers, they all had to write. They wrote uh, on paper and on parchment. And Thomas Jefferson and Madison and Adams, they all had to write. They didn't have text. They didn't have phones. They didn't have typing. They put their thoughts down on paper. And that's why I think they were so successful and were, was able to birth a nation is because they actually thought about their thoughts and they wrote them down. So this is a, a powerful gift that we've been given to be able to journal. I wish I had started it earlier. It's a fairly new exercise for me, but I'm finding some great dividends from it. Oh, yeah. You know, in, in that illustration of our founding fathers as being the, the 4th of July, they also, after writing it down, you know, they wrote it down, they mapped out their plan, and then they did it. Right. That's one of the things that in, in even my walk with the Lord, I'll get to the point where, you know, I've studied it. I've written it down. I know what God wants me to do. And then I stop because some fear comes in, some I'm not worthy or what are other people going to say? You know, something starts playing in my mind. And I've got, I've been really working on that of like Nehemiah is, is the, what's really been laid on my heart lately. You know, he's a servant and God tells him to go rebuild Jerusalem. He's like, I'm a slave. I don't own anything. I don't have any rights. And God says, you know, just tell the king. And, you know, he struggles with it. He's restless nights. And then when he tells the king, the king goes, oh, okay, here, here's everything you need. That's fantastic. I love it. That's, and that's a, that's a great example for us that we can't let our anxieties and our fears uh, hold us back. Uh, that's the enemy at work trying to plant seeds of doubt. Uh, so that's a great witness that Nehemiah left us in scripture. Don't you find that some of your biggest distractors in your life are the people who are the closest to you? Uh, I hate to admit that that's probably true. Um, yes. Um, and, and, um, and I don't know what the remedy is for that, uh, particularly if they're loved ones. Uh, that's a tough one. Have you got any thoughts on that? Well, what I, in my own life, two things I, I've, try to be one, I try to be an encourager. So if someone is saying, Hey, I think the Lord's laying this on my heart or, or they don't even use that terminology. Hey, I think I'm going to go do this new thing instead of being like, what are you talking? You, you can't do that. You know, instead of trying, you know, coming back with like more encouragement or more asking questions that are positive. So it's one thing I've been working on in my life. The other is people who in my life that are like that, when the moment is not heated, when there's not a, a, a brewing argument to go sit down with them and say, hey, I don't know if you mean to come off this way or if you you know are, but when I say I'm going to go try this and comes off, what I have found is that that negative spirit that they have is not meant. Mm -hmm. It's just been a knee jerk reaction. It's the first thing that comes out of their mouth. And then once it's out, it's out. And then, you know, you say something back and then the argument ensues. But if I can get to them just in a, you know, random morning afternoon and, and say, hey, let's go get a cup of coffee and sit down and say, hey, how's your day? Blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, every time I bring up that I'm going to do something like this, you have a really negative spirit. And normally they look at me and say, what? What are you talking about? They don't even realize they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a uh, good, good counsel there to lean into the conversation at a time when uh, the air is cleared and it's not uh, sort of in the middle of the, of the tension to come back to it later when you can enter into it with a cup of coffee after the dust is settled and then 
re-engage uh, so that you can unpack the fact that maybe they weren't aware of how they were coming across. Uh, that takes intentional living there. That's mature living. Uh, so I will, I will uh, take a page out of that playbook. And it, it's, t- you know, at that point too, then I have to kind of put on my big boy britches and be able to explain, you know, if I'm going to do this, what are the steps? So that comes back to that writing. What's the planning? Because if I'm going to do it, it needs to be done right. It needs to be done in a timely manner. It needs to, all the nuts and bolts need to be there. So if I'm, if I'm going to get offended that somebody doesn't think I can do it, then I need to be able to prove to them how I'm going to do it. And some of it I can't answer because it's unknown, but you can have a, a structure there. And mm-hmm. I think that misses a lot of times in people's lives is they want to do something Um, but it's just a dream, you know, it's a 30,000 foot dream. They haven't really put any thought into it. And so then the family member of loved ones, like, oh my gosh, here goes Nathan again. And I've started trying to plan in that. Mm -hmm. That's good. Well, uh, I need to give that some more thought. Um, something just came to my mind that, uh, when we were talking about the things that uh, people can do that might be struggling, there's a there's a book out there. You're going to know this book instantly when I show it to you. I'm sure you've been through it, uh, but it's a classic. It's become one of these classics that, uh, and I haven't heard a lot about this particular book lately. I'm going to hold it up here for your viewers to see. It's called uh, Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. And, you know, when this book came out, I remember when Rick Warren was on the Larry King show, back when Larry King was still on CNN and had his uh, had his talk show. And, uh, you know, Larry was very, very intrigued by Rick Warren's language that he was using and his boldness of faith. But the first sentence in the first chapter of that book, if you'll recall, is it's not about you. It's not about you. And I think that's a powerful, a powerful thing to remember, because this life that we're all in the midst of trying to figure out, it really isn't about us. It's about others and what we can do to encourage and support others. Yes, we've got to pay the rent. We've got to go to work. We have our own responsibilities. But if we lived a selfless, sacrificial life that put others first and made others successful, where we got a chance to be servant leaders for others, I think it would also be a better place. Oh, a- a- absolutely. That whole concept, whether you're in a marriage, whether your relationship with kids, uh, employees, employer, people at church, putting them in front. And it goes, man, it, it, it's easy to say, but it goes directly against every part of your flesh. Because when I was born, I was born for number one. That's my sin nature my pride, my ego, my self-centeredness. But when I find myself trying to help others get to where they want to go, whether it's my wife or my daughter or people around me, then all of a sudden I get this wave coming up, helping me get to where I want to go. Yeah. Well, I think, I think you and I both have leadership qualities and leadership tendencies. Uh, I don't know what your Myers-Briggs is or what your, uh, Antiogram is. I recently went through this diagnostic of something called an antiogram, and it's like Myers Briggs on steroids. And I have discovered that I'm a controlling person. I have a tendency to want to be very controlling and do things my way. Uh, but this antiogram will reveal how your natural tendencies at their absolute best can reveal themselves and how your natural tendencies and natural personality type type at its worst can reveal itself. So I'm trying to take my natural tendencies where I like to be in charge and be the leader and see how I can calibrate that in a way that allows me to come alongside someone else and help them be successful. Because the people that are leading today in churches, in politics, Um, in other forms of life, you know, principals and schools, they need people they can trust to come alongside them that also have leadership giftings. Oh, absolutely. To be an advisor 
to be someone that can help them with their role of leadership that you and I may not be in at the moment, but they need someone like us they can trust to be wise counsel. And I have found that that role in life has its place. Have you seen the uh, DISC, D-I-S-C um, program out there? It's been around for, I don't know, 30 or something years, but they just came out with one called, well, it's probably been out for five or six years, the Christian D-I-S-C. I have not. I have not. And um, I'm actually in the process of getting my certification to, to do the assessment with folks, but if you go to Google and search Christian disc, there's places out there like $29 to $49. You take this online and I can't remember it's um, several pages, a hundred and something questions or something like that. And then you get this like 20 ish page that tells you all that personality style, but yeah. it comes from a Christian perspective, which makes it really cool on like the church leadership style or the relationship style, because instead of it, giving you all the outlines of your personality, it gives you that information, but then it also, especially the negative sides, it tells you, you know, what the Bible says about those negative traits. Wow. That's fantastic. I'm definitely going to want to check that out because I think for us to be good Christian leaders, Christian encouragers, we have to first know ourselves and by knowing yourself well, with the help of diagnostic tools like that and others, uh, you're really doing uh, yourself and others a great service because it's hard to be a true encourager of someone else and go deep if you don't know yourself. I think knowing yourself through your shortcomings and through your tendencies uh, can be very, very helpful. And you only really unpack that with any sort of depth and clarity by taking a diagnostic like that, because you're not going to naturally just sort of figure it out on your own, because we don't want to admit our shortcomings. We don't want to acknowledge that we're weak in a certain area, or that we have bad habits that tend to be off-putting to other people. Uh, a clinical diagnostic can do a deep dive and help us accept those things, because when you read it in black and white, because you answered the questions, uh, it's hard to ignore it. Well, if you find yourself saying, that's not my fault, it's their fault or her fault or his fault, and that's the common answer you give or the common thought you have for every problem you have in your life, which is where I got to in mine, I got some sad news for you. The problem is you. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's funny now to, to hear you say that, but you are so right. That is exactly, exactly right. And it's liberating once you discover that. And you can accept it. And then you begin to take that journey towards the road of recovery and you become a better you so that you can help other people. And then if you stay in that mindset or at least try to stay, I man, I'll catch myself racquetball or, or even in a relationship with my wife that I'll say something or I'll do something. And then I have to turn right back around and say, you know what? I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have done that. My apologies. Let me see if I can, you know, do this and make it right. Because then once we figure out the problem we have, then we have to self-check ourselves along the way to make sure we stay, you know, out of getting back into that track. Yeah, that's the beauty of God's design of marriage. The covenant relationship of marriage allows two centers to come together, brush up against each other, uh, and lovingly, lovingly point out each other's shortcomings while extending grace and forgiveness along the way. Yep. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Well, brother, I really appreciate your, your time and coming on. Is there anything to kind of wrap up today? And I'd love to have you back on again, because I think there's a lot of things um, between your background and my background and in your points about the, the three things of, of helping people that we could really dig into some subjects and um, share people, you know, we, I want to encourage people to share their story because as you share your story, it creates a relationship. It shows vulnerability. It shows transparency of like, hey, that person's not perfect. So they're like me. Yeah. Well, I'm far from perfect and I've stubbed my toe so many times along the way and I'm still trying to figure it out. Uh, maybe next time we could talk a little bit about Israel and how a trip to the Holy Land can put one's understanding of the Bible and faith kind of in technicolor. 
Um, it was uh, it was an incredible journey. And uh, while I was there, I, I swam in the Sea of Galilee. The Mediterranean Sea was baptized in the Jordan River uh, and floated in the Dead Sea. So I experienced uh, not only uh, the, mir the, mir the miraculous history of Israel, which is largely a desert, but I think I immersed myself in every single waterway and opportunity to get wet in Israel. I even went to a place called Ian Gedi, where David fled from Saul uh, in the desert, not too far from Masada, and went to these wonderful springs um, and enjoyed uh, some cooling off because it's really hot over there. It was like 110 degrees, and that was back in early June. Now, did you coat yourself with the mud before you got in the Dead Sea, or did you? You know, out? I I didn't do the mud. My pastor did, and some others did. I decided to forego the mud and just simply get out into the water. Uh, maybe next time. What was it? It would itch at all, or because I did it without, and then I had to come back out and shower and put mud on because that, that water, that salt uh, in the minerals and stuff made my tender little skin itch. <laughs> yeah, I was good for about 15, 20 minutes. Good. Well, yeah, let's let's get you back on and talk about that. Hey, man, I really appreciate you, uh, you know, opening it up because in our society today, kind of the Marlboro man thought or, you know, even for women of, you know, be strong individuals, be tough. Don't, you know, don't let them see you sweat or don't let them see you, you know, weak. And from a Christian, and I understand that. I mean, we need to be meek and not weak, but we also need to be compassionate and we need to show others that, hey, I'm not perfect. I've got problems too. And so I really appreciate you opening up today and, and sharing that, hey, I have issues, but God has been there for me time and time again. Yep. I really appreciate it, Nathan, and I look forward to our next chat. All right. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful uh, and happy 4th of July, and I look forward to getting together with you again. Thank you so much. Take care.